here we go. Hi students. Uh, welcome to the video lecture to get you started on module three for pathophysiology. Uh, this module is all about disorders of the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Uh, so to get a good grasp on this module, you really need a good understanding or good knowledge of uh, some things you learned in anatomy, specifically uh, cardio. So we're going to just review a little bit of that really quick before we hop into cardio-specific pathophysiology. Okay, so the very first thing you need to know is just remembering the flow of blood through the heart. Um, in cardio, I'm sure you had to memorize this diagram and remember like all the different uh, valves and everything like that. Um, the good news is for uh, patho, you don't need to know quite that level of detail, but what you do need to know are the following things. Um, so you need to know that in general, or not in general, always, arteries carry blood away from the heart. The way I always remember that is arteries and A both begin, or and away, both begin with the letter A. Um, and then veins carry blood towards the heart. Um, I think sometimes there is a misconception that arteries carry oxygenated blood. That is almost always true, with the exception of the pulmonary artery. So it's better to remember arteries carry blood away from the heart. Um, the next thing you need to remember is that blood enters the heart, regardless of which side of the heart it's going to, through the atriums, and that it is ejected from the heart through the ventricles. The next thing you have to remember um, is that the right side of the heart, so in this diagram, the right side of the heart, uh, that is the side that's getting blood from the body, and that it's pumping blood to the lungs. And then the left side of the heart is what is receiving that uh, blood from the lungs and then pumping it to the rest of the body. So in general, the left side of the heart is much um, stronger, like the muscle itself is much thicker. And that's because the left side of the heart has to work a lot harder because it's pumping blood all throughout the entire body. Um, and then just a quick remi er, reminder of the difference of, between arteries and veins. These are both different types of blood vessels. Um, so arteries, remember uh, blood moving away from the heart. Arteries um, actually have a layer of smooth muscle um, that's part of the vessel. And because of that, the arteries themselves can constrict and dilate. So you can think the arteries kind of almost can like kind of help a little bit because they can like swoosh or push the blood through. Um, because arteries are able to uh, dilate and contract, that means that when we're talking about something like blood pressure, um, the arteries are the ones that are involved deeply with blood pressure. Because if you have really narrow arteries, the heart's having to work a lot harder to pump against those arteries, and that's going to um, result in higher blood pressure. Uh, so arteries have smooth muscles that allows them to expand and contract. Um, veins, on the other hand, they do have a little bit of smooth muscle, but they, they don't really do that expanding and contracting. Instead, the special things that veins have is they actually have valves. Um, so since they don't have muscle to kind of help move the blood along, the valves are there to prevent blood from flowing backwards. Um, so for this, I always think of the veins in your leg. Um, in your leg, that blood is having to get pumped back up to your heart. So you can imagine it's having to go <laughs> against gravity. So the veins or the valves in the veins just help keep that flow of blood directional and keep it from going backwards. Um, a trick I have to remember that is that veins have valves. Both begin with B. Okay, so that's blood through just literally just the heart and then arteries versus veins. The next thing you need to remember is the blood flow through the entire circulation, but essentially from the body. So um, I really like this diagram. We are gonna use it a lot. I recommend that when you sit down to take the midterm, the very first thing you do on your piece of scratch paper is draw a version of this diagram because it's gonna help you out so much on applying the knowledge of how the circulatory system works. So uh, we have the systemic circulation, so the body, meaning everything that's not the heart and not the lungs. So blood goes from the systemic circulation and it enters the right side of the heart. So this blood is deoxygenated, meaning uh, the hemoglobin inside of the red blood cells is not carrying oxygen at this time. So then the right side of the heart pumps that blood to the lungs where it's going to get oxygenated and the hemoglobin is going to swap out carbon dioxide for oxygen. And then the blood goes from the lungs into the left side of the heart. Um, the left side of the heart now is pumping that oxygenated blood back to the rest of the body or back to the systemic circulation. 
um, I cannot emphasize strongly enough how essential this is. So if you're like, ooh, it's been a minute since I thought this, just draw this little circle like 10 times until you've got it down super easy because you absolutely need to know this 100% for the midterm. Let's do a check for understanding. Um, okay, so for these checks for understanding, I'll pause for like a second. During that pause, you can pause the video and think about it and then unpause it and I'll say the answer as opposed to me like sitting here awkwardly for five seconds. Okay, so first one, which side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs? This should be an easy one. If you don't remember, look at your little diagram, right? Uh, the right side of the heart is pumping blood to the lungs, so right side. Blood entering the right side of the heart comes from, so that would be the body. Once again, if you missed that, look at the diagram. Right side of the heart, where is it? The blood coming from? It's coming from the body or the system circulation. Okay, one more. If the left side of the heart is not pumping effectively, there would be increased blood pooling where? Okay, this one's a little trickier. So now think, essentially if there was like a, a dam or something here that stopped the left side of the heart from working, blood is still trying to move. Where would the blood get stuck? It would get stuck in the lungs. Um, so that, what we just did, that's essentially the knowledge that you need to have for this unit for pathophysiology to help you understand um, all the different signs and symptoms that are associated with heart failure. Important. I already said this. It's so important. I put it on here twice. Please know the flow of blood through the body. Okay. Next thing to remember um, from uh, just A and P is the difference between systole and diastole. So diastole is it's uh, relaxing and the heart is filling. So um, the way I always remember this is your diaphragm helps your lungs expand and like fill with air. So diaphragm, diastole that helps you remember it's like your heart is expanding and filling with blood. And then systole, the heart contracts and ejects um, blood. And then the last concept that is important to remember um, is preload and afterload. Um, so you're not necessarily going to need to use these terms in patho, but understanding what they are and how they can contribute to disease is going to be important for understanding things like heart failure. Um, so preload is the amount of blood in the heart at the end of diastole. So meaning essentially once that heart relaxes and expands, how much blood gets into the heart. Um, so that would be the relaxed volume. Um, so if there's something going on where the heart isn't able to relax all the way, that's gonna cause a problem because the heart won't be able to fill with enough blood. And so that's gonna cause downstream effects. Um, afterload on the other hand is essentially pumping the blood out of the heart and how hard it is to do that. So it's the amount of vascular resistance, meaning um, how narrow those arteries are and how hard the heart is having to push to pump the blood through those arteries. Um, so depending on which side of the heart we're talking about, the afterload is going to be different. Remember, the right side of the heart pumps blood to the circulation, or sorry, to the lungs, the pulmonary circulation. Um, so right heart afterload is specifically the resistance to pump blood to the lungs. So if you have some sort of um, lung disease, like a pulmonary disease, that's making it harder to pump blood to the lungs, that's going to have a secondary effect of putting strain on the heart. And then the left heart afterload would be, now the left heart is having to push really hard to pump um, blood to the rest of the body. So this would be like if you had high blood pressure or if you had atherosclerosis really severely that was narrowing the size of those arteries, that's going to make the left heart work a lot harder because it's having to pump against all of those uh, peripheral vas or arteries. Okay. And then the, la or then the next thing is um, just a reminder about what happens in the pulmonary circulation. So once again, the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs, or more scientifically, we would say to the pulmonary circulation. And then what happens within the lungs is gas exchange, meaning CO2, which is a waste product, is breathed out or exchanged out. And then oxygen, which is what we need to do cellular respiration, is absorbed in. This occurs in the alveoli. So these are the functional unit of the lungs. Um, so if you don't have healthy alveoli, the response or the impact is going to be that you're not going to have efficient gas exchange. Um, and then that oxygenated blood just returns to the left side of the heart. 
And then finally, a reminder of coronary circulation. I always found this one a little confusing because we're like talking about circulation and that has to do with the heart and the coronary circulation. And you're like, what? Um, so coronary means heart. So this is literally the circulation that is blood pumped to the heart because the heart is an organ. It has tissues. It needs its own oxygen. Um, so it actually has its own circulation. But think about this. The blood that's coming out of that left ventricle is getting pumped hard because it has to go all throughout the entire body. Um, so because it's getting pumped so hard, these uh, arteries and veins in the coronary uh, blood supply are really, really narrow. Um, otherwise, it would just be like getting blasted with so much blood, right? So um, those uh, vessels need to be really narrow. Um, the downside of that is, is because those vessels are so narrow, they are especially prone to getting blocked um, with things like atherosclerosis. Uh, that on top of the fact that the heart is working all the time and needs a lot of oxygen is why things like coronary artery disease are such a problem. Okay, next check for understanding. What are coronary arteries? So coronary mean, means heart and an artery carries blood away. So these are arteries that are carrying oxygenated blood away from the heart, but to the heart. So these are arteries that are going and carrying blood into that coronary circulation. I know it feels like a double, a double heart thing. Okay. Why are coronary arteries especially prone to things like atherosclerosis? So remember from last week, atherosclerosis is when you have narrowing of the uh, blood vessels because of a buildup of plaque. So of a buildup of like cholesterol containing plaque deposits. Um, because the coronary arteries are so narrow, they're just more prone to that because a little bit of buildup is going to make a big difference. Okay, I know that was a good chunk of review, but like I said, it's going to really help with the content for this module. So I want to take some time on it. So let's, no, not click on that. Great, <laughs> let's move on to chapter 17, which is heart failure. I'm going to go slightly out of order um, for the chapters just because to me it makes more sense to do heart failure first. So we're going to start with chapter 17. Okay, so first off, what is heart failure? It is very much what it sounds like. Your heart fails to pump. So this is caused by when the heart is essentially so weak that it either just can't pump blood enough um, or there's like such high demand that your heart is unable to, to meet that demand. So essentially your heart is just not doing the job it's supposed to do, it's failing. Uh, so this is a nice little map from the CDC that shows the, um, prevalence of heart disease throughout the country. Um, it is the most frequent cause of hospitalization of people over 65 years of age. There are many risk factors that can contribute to heart failure. Um, pretty much it's anything that's going to put excess strain on the heart. So excess strain, meaning like a pathological bad amount of strain. So if you're just exercising, that's strain on your heart, but that's like healthy physiological strain, your heart has a chance to recover for it. Excess strain would be like the heart is working hard all the time and it never has a chance to rest. Um, so some examples, lots of things, just age in general. Um, if you have some sort of atherosclerosis that predisposes you to have uh, ischemia, so blockage of those vessels, um, diabetes and hypertension are two classic risk factors. Um, obesity, pulmonary issues, we'll talk about that one more in a bit. Uh, kidney disease, because Kidneys have a lot to do with regulating fluid in the body and excess fluid can put a uh, strain on the heart and smoking and alcohol. Okay, so um, there are lots of different types of heart failure. Uh, your textbook talks about lots and lots of different categories. Um, there are many different ways that we can talk about how the heart is not doing what it's supposed to do. For the midterm, the most important thing for you to understand is the difference between right-sided and left-sided heart failure. Um, so right-sided meaning specifically the issue has originated with the right start side of the heart. Left side, the issue originated with the left side of the heart. This is a bit of an oversimplification. Um, I do think it's a helpful oversimplification because it really helps you understand like the cause and effect that's causing the heart failure. Um, but in reality, most people who present with heart failure have a combination of both, because if you have prolonged right side heart failure, it will eventually lead to left side heart failure and vice versa. Um, but it is helpful for understanding 
things like signs and symptoms. So that's why I think it's worth focusing on this, even though it is a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, this is a flowchart. You can read it. Like I said, we are going to be focusing on this level of heart failure. There are many other types of heart failure that we are not going to worry about quite as much, or we're not going to like go down to that level of detail. So um, like I said, there's lots of different types of heart failure. So it makes sense that there's lots of different etiologies, meaning lots of different ways that heart failure can be caused. Um, so all of those etiologies cause either insufficient heart pumping, uh, meaning the muscle is just too weak. Uh, so that can be due to decreased stroke volume or decreased filling of the heart. Um, for example, in a heart attack, myocardial infarction, there is is damage to the tissue, so some of the heart muscle has literally died. And because of that, the heart is just not going to be able to contract as strongly. So that would be inefficient pumping. So that's option number one. The heart just isn't pumping as well as it used to. Or uh, the heart just has to work harder than it should. Um, so a good way to think of this is, sorry, I have this little guy here. Think about when you go to the gym and you're trying to like lift weights. Um, and you're you're not succeeding. <laughs> it could be because like you're you're too weak. Uh, maybe you like tweaked a muscle or something, and now you can't lift that weight that you were able to to lift last week because your muscle is just not in good shape. Or maybe you can't lift that weight because it is just way too heavy for you. Um, so this would be uh, heart failure caused by increased workload. So the heart is just being asked to do way more than it should have to do. So this is usually due to increased afterload. So this would be like um, hypertension, for example. So specifically pulmonary hypertension, which is high blood pressure in the pulmonary circulation, so in the lungs. That means that because of that, the right side of the heart is having to press or push so much harder to get the blood into the lungs. Um, and so that right side of the heart is going to fail um, eventually because it just is working overload all the time. So those are the two main causes. Either the heart has gotten weakened, so it cannot pump the way it needs to, or the heart is having to work too hard to pump blood out. Okay. Check for understanding. Hey, look at their helpful little uh, diagram here. Oh, I forgot to put the answer on this one. That's okay, we'll talk about it. Um, so with untreated systemic high blood pressure, so hypertension, uh, systemic meaning in the body, be more likely to cause right side or left side heart failure and why? Okay, so for this one, we're going to look at the diagram. Here's the problem, systemic circulation. So it is making the heart work harder to get the blood here. Which side of the heart has to work harder? The left side, because the left side is what is pumping to the systemic circulation, right? The right side doesn't care. It gets blood from the systemic circulation. The left side has to push really hard to get it there. Um, so that would be, sorry, like I said, there was no answer on this one. Uh, that would be the answer. So this would be more likely to cause left-sided heart failure. Okay. Um, so a lot of, or the vast majority, 75% of um, heart failure is due to some sort of ischemic heart disease, meaning a lack of blood flow getting delivered to the heart. So a heart attack. Um, Makes sense that that is causing dysfunction of the heart. If the heart is not getting enough oxygen, it's not going to work as well as it needs to. If the heart doesn't get enough oxygen for a prolonged period of time, then some of those cells are going to die and then it's going to atrophy or it's going to waste away and degenerate and the heart is not going to work as well as it needs to. So both of those things, it's logical how that can lead to the type of heart failure that's due to weakness. Um, in addition, if you have something like a myocardial infarction or like a heart attack, that's actually going to cause scarring of the heart. Um, think about like a really big, nasty scar. It's often that tissue is not back to 100%. Oftentimes it's like kind of stiff. The same thing would happen in the heart. So even if that tissue did heal, it's going to have stiffness and it's just not going to be as uh, contractile as it used to be. Um, so in general, this type of etiology, so something that is involving ischemic heart disease, so a lack of oxygen getting to the coronary circulation, that tends to cause left-sided heart failure. Um, 
yes, you're like, why is left side? Well, generally it's because the left side is the stronger muscle and it has to work harder. Um, so if there's a decrease in essentially oxygen getting to the left side of the heart or to both sides of the heart, it's going to affect the left side more because the left side has to work harder regardless. Um, so it's just more oxygen hungry. So it's more impacted by a decrease in oxygen. Okay. So key point, tattoo this into your brain. In general, if you have inadequate pumping, pumping to the systemic circulation, so the body is not getting a sufficient amount of blood, that is usually due to left heart failure. So if the left side of the heart is not working well enough, that means all of the tissues are not getting perfused. They're not getting enough blood. So you're going to have issues with like kidney function and liver function because they're not getting enough blood to them. So they're not going to be working as well as they are. Uh, you're going to have issues with like um, your fingertips not getting enough blood to them. So they're going to look pale or maybe even blue things like that. So all of these are examples of signs and symptoms of left side heart failure. And it makes sense if you think, oh, the left side is pumping blood to the rest of the body. Um, so some specific etiologies that can cause this left-sided heart failure, um, like I mentioned before, hypertension, specifically that systemic peripheral hypertension. So hypertension in all of the body. Um, hypertension is high blood pressure. So once again, that's a narrowing in the arteries, the heart's having to push harder, the left side of the heart specifically, so it is going to get weakened. Um, oh, I just cut off that. So increased systemic arterial pressure leads to increased uh, left ventricular workload, so it's having to work harder. Uh, that eventually over time will lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. So the ventricle is going to, tr the muscle is going to try to strengthen itself, but it's going to have to do it like so fast and without enough nutrients that it's going to be pathological hypertrophy. So it's going to get bigger, but not in a way um, that is as that is working well. Um, because of that, because of this pathological hypertrophy, you can think it's almost like the heart is trying to make, you know, enlarge these muscle cells and make them meet demand. And it's doing it so fast that it's not able to increase blood flow to those new bigger cells. So in general, the left side of the heart is not getting enough oxygen which results in hypoxia or ischemia, like I said. Um, so then that causes overall, over time, degeneration of the left side of the heart and then causes heart failure. Um, so hypertension, high blood pressure is the number one cause of left-sided heart failure. Once again, inadequate pumping to the systemic circulation, we think left side heart failure. Okay. So that's left heart failure. Let's think about right heart failure. Um, so one of the most common causes of right heart failure, kind of similar to if we go back here when we're talking about hypertension in the periphery causing left side heart failure, if the heart is having to work really hard against the pulmonary circulation, so if there's like pulmonary hypertension, that can cause right side heart failure. Um, so for example, if you have a chronic pulmonary disease, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, um, that means that there's going to be increased resistance. Uh, the vessels are going to be smaller. The lungs also just like the alveoli are maybe going to be occluded. And that's going to also kind of like push on the vessels and make it harder to get blood through the circulation. That's going to increase the workload, meaning increase how hard the right side of the heart is having to work. And then that will lead to pathological right ventricular hypertrophy. And same as before, that Pathological hypertrophic muscle is not getting enough oxygen, so that leads to degeneration. And similarly, this uh, COPD, so kind of like same idea of like pulmonary hypertension, is the leading cause of right side heart failure. In fact, there's even a special name for this. It's called poor pulmonale. Um, so poor kind of sounds like coronary heart pulmonale, pulmonary heart, so it's like heart lungs. So this is the type of heart failure that originates from the lungs. So the original problem is in the lungs. So this is in part why things like sleep apnea can be so dangerous because over time, if untreated, it can like lead to right-sided heart failure. So key thing to remember here is if you have right-sided heart failure, the right side of the heart is not working as effectively as it should, which means the, um, the 
outcome is going to be the lungs are not getting enough blood because the right side isn't able to meet that demand. Okay, I forgot all the answers on these. <laughs> okay, sorry, guys. Uh, so next trick for understanding, uh, what is the leading cause of left heart failure? So that would be hypertension, uh, specifically systemic hypertension, so like what we normally think of as high blood pressure. Next one. Um, ischemic cardiomyopathy, such as a heart attack, so not getting enough oxygen to the heart, is more likely to cause what kind of heart failure, left or right? Yeah, so that's going to be left side heart failure, and that's because the left side of the heart works harder, so it normally needs more oxygen, so it's going to be more uh, impacted by that decrease in oxygenation. And then finally, what is the term for right heart failure that is caused by chronic pulmonary disease? That's core pulmonale. I'm sorry, let me just go back here so you can see how that is spelled. Core pulmonale. Okay. So those are the different types of heart failure. Like I said, you really just need to know left side and right side heart failure. And then that one example of one specific type of right-sided heart failure, which is core pulmonale. The most important thing for you to understand is once you have heart failure, what are the signs and symptoms? And essentially there are two categories of signs and symptoms. The first are called forward effects. So that would be, if we're say we're talking about the right side of the heart, where's forward from that? The lungs. So if the right side of the heart is not working, what's not going to get enough blood? the lungs. So you're going to have increased, or sorry, you're going to have decreased perfusion, meaning decreased blood delivery to the lungs. That's the forward effect. If you have right side heart failure and we're thinking of a backwards effect, it's like, okay, the heart is supposed to be pumping that blood out. If it's not working, essentially you're going to get like a buildup of blood from the place before. So it's kind of that example I gave before. Think of like we put a dam on the right side of the heart. If you put a dam in that river, water's going to back up, right? So there's going to be blood pooling in the step before, which is going to be the systemic circulation. Blood pooling is going to increase hydrostatic pressure, meaning just increase like the amount of fluid that's pressing against the vasculature. And that causes edema. In other words, that causes swelling. And it can cause swelling in different places. We often think of swelling as like in your feet or in your hands. Edema just means like there's too much fluid wherever. So you can have edema and all over the body. So once again, forward effects, that's whatever's not getting enough perfusion, meaning it's not getting enough blood delivery. Backwards effects, we're having buildup, pooling of blood, and that's causing edema. And you can have forward and backwards effects for right or left side. I just only pointed it out. I really like that I talked about this dam. And then look, I made a picture to help you explain backwards effects. If only I would just keep clicking through my own slides. <laughs> okay, um, just a moment to remind yourself what hydrostatic pressure is. Uh, so once again, that is the pressure of essentially like how much fluid is in the blood and how much is it pushing against the blood walls. This comes back to osmosis, which you learned about in biology. Um, so, if you have increased hydrostatic pressure, it can actually be so much pressure that it's like squeezing liquid from the blood into the tissue, so into the interstitial space. So that is in part what can cause edema. Um, the other thing that has to do with osmosis and how we learned about it more in biology class is um, oncotic pressure that has to do with the amount of solutes. So another way you can have edema is let's say that you have a significant decrease in the amount of solutes in the blood, like maybe you drink too much water, um, that's going to end up causing water to move out of the blood and into the um, interstitial space due to oncotic pressure, and that can also cause edema. But for heart failure, we're mostly thinking about just the hydrostatic edema, which is the one I think is intuitively makes more sense. If you have just a way a ton of blood in here, it's going to squeeze blood out of the vessels and into um, the periphery into the tissues. Okay, so once again, edema um, is just swelling. So caused by too much fluid trapped within certain body tissues, you can have edema in different types of areas. So 
edema. Um, we usually think of it being caused by increased hydrostatic pressure, specifically in this unit. In other units, we'll learn about edema caused by decreased oncotic pressure. But for today, this week, it's increased hydrostatic pressure. So here are some examples of edema. So pitting edema. So this is someone who has edema or swelling in their legs. And it's called pitting edema because you can actually press on their legs and it leaves like a, a dent for a little while until it fills back up. So what happened is you were able to, with your finger, essentially push some of that liquid back in and it's going to take a second for it to fill up that space. Um, pulmonary edema. So this would be a buildup of fluid in the pulmonary system. So essentially fluid in the lungs is what we would say more commonly. Um, and then ascites, this is a buildup of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. So essentially like a buildup of fluid in the abdomen. Um, all of these are associated with different types of heart failure. So now we're going to learn about how to think about which one is associated with which type of heart failure. Check for understanding. Excess fluid accumulation and edema are due to what kind of effects of heart failure, forward or backwards? This is going to be backwards effects. And if you're like, ooh, I didn't get that right, let me come back here to this picture of the dam. So we're having all this blood pooling that's causing increased hydrostatic pressure, which causes edema. That's really important to know for when we start to learn about the signs and symptoms, because that piece of understanding, together with knowing the uh, flow of blood through the circulation, you can pretty much logic yourself through all of the signs and symptoms. Yay! So instead of having to memorize a bunch of things, you only have to memorize that backwards effects are going to cause uh, edema or swelling in the place before the heart failure. And then you just remember the flow of blood through the body. And then you can just do it all with your big smart brain. So you got it. Okay, so let's talk about signs and symptoms of left side heart failure. So we're talking about the left side of the heart and it's not working as effectively. That means there's a, a dam in the left side. Where is that blood backing up? Where is it pooling? It's backing up into the pulmonary circulation because that is the step backwards. That is the step right before the left side of the heart. So we're going to get edema where? In the lungs. So our backwards effects of late side, left side heart failure are going to be due to fluid stuck in the lungs. Um, so what kind of stuff do you think that's going to be? Fluid in the lungs. You're going to have like coughing. You're going to have difficulty breathing. See how we can logic our way through this. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then forward effects. So because the left side of the heart is not working as effectively, um, it is not going to be able to perfuse, meaning it's not going to get enough blood to the rest of the circulation. Um, so our forward effects, like I said, are going to be due to decreased perfusion of those peripheral tissues. They're not getting enough blood. Okay. So keep that in mind. Of our, as we think about our signs and symptoms, I've got this little picture here to help you. Uh, it's a little visual cue to help you remember this. Okay. Um, so some backwards effects. Uh, Buildup of hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary system. So once again, the dam's in the left side of the heart. So where is the edema in the pulmonary system? So number one signs and system would be pulmonary edema, excess fluid in the lung. Because of that uh, pulmonary edema, you're going to get symptoms due to fluid in the lung. So cough. If you have a bunch of junk in your lungs, what are you going to do? You're going to cough. Um, you're also going to have dyspnea, which is troubled breathing. Uh, one of the prefixes we learned was dys, which means difficult. Uh, so difficulty breathing. Um, orthopnea. So ortho means uh, like straight or upright. So, or not. I think of like a 90 degree angle for some reason with um, ortho for reasons I don't understand. Orthogonal. Anyway, that's math. Um, so orthopnea is shortness of breath specifically while lying down. Um, so if you're standing upright, you might be okay. If you land all the way down, essentially that fluid in the lungs is going to just like really make a bigger difference and kind of flatten the lungs. It's going to make more difficulty breathing. So for that person, if they prop themselves up with some pillows, now they're going to be able to breathe a lot more easier. Easy. -er. So that is a classic symptom of left side heart failure. Another one, proximal nocturnal dyspnea. Uh, so nocturnal, meaning uh, during the night. So this is essentially ortho orthopnea, but while sleeping. So the nocturnal tells you it's while sleeping. And it's kind of the same idea. You're laying down, that fluid is spreading out. Um, and just as you're laying down for a long period of time, like when you're sleeping, it's just more time for that fluid to spread out and for that effect to be normal. Um, these two, orthopnea and PND, 
these are the classic symptoms or some of the classic symptoms of left side heart failure. So definitely know those ones. Oh, and the last one, crackles. Uh, so osculation, meaning like listening to lung sounds with a stethoscope. If there's fluid in the lungs, you're going to hear the sound of fluid in there, which sounds like crackles. So if you are curious what that sounds like, ooh, I hope you can hear this. Share sound. Hopefully now you can. Uh, this video just um, helps you hear what crackles sound like. exactly like the term sounds like crackles <laughs> we got it um okay so those are back side effects for left side heart failure all of the backwards effects were due to pulmonary edema so fluid in the lungs now we're thinking about the forward effects so all of those forward effects are going to be due to decreased perfusion of the tissues so the tissues in the rest of the body are not getting enough blood the effect of that is going to depend on the organ that we are talking about. Um, the organs that are most affected are those that need a lot of perfusion, meaning there's a lot of blood running through them in order to do their jobs normally. For example, the brain and the kidneys. Um, the brain has to work really, really hard. It's very hungry. It uses a ton of energy. So if the brain is not getting adequate perfusion, the brain is not going to work effectively because it's so metabolically active. And then the kidneys, need a lot of perfusion because the kidneys are filtering your blood. So if you don't have enough blood going through the kidneys, then the kidneys just aren't able to work. So because of the, um, speaking of the brain specifically, well, if the brain's not getting enough blood, what are going to be some of the symptoms? So things like confusion, anxiety, the brain's not working the way it needs to. Um, if the kidneys are working well enough, what are going to be some of the symptoms? Well, the kidneys make urine, right? So if the kidneys aren't doing their job, you're going to have decreased urinary output. Forward effects of left side heart failure. Um, because specifically of this, <clears throat> sorry, decreased urinary output, um, the built in homeostatic mechanisms in your body are trying to, are going to try to fix that. Um, so you'll have some compensatory signs and symptoms. Uh, so things like increased blood pressure and increased heart rate. Um, because you're not getting enough perfusion of the kidneys, the kidneys are going to be like, yo, can we increase the perfusion here? Can we like get blood flowing more? And so it's going to send out uh, through the renin angiotensin system um, different modulators that increase perfusion of the kidneys through increasing the blood pressure and increasing the heart rate. Sounds great, right? Except you're in left side heart failure. That's probably caused by increased uh, blood pressure already. So uh, this actually is going to make the left side heart failure worse. Um, so this is sort of a of like positive feedback loop or like a uh, runaway train. It's going to just make things worse. OK, so now let's go ahead and do a check for understanding. So for both of these, I want you to think, is this an example for left side heart failure of a backwards effect or of a forwards effect? OK, confusion. Confusion would be caused by inadequate perfusion to the brain. So if we're talking about perfusion, if we're talking about an organ not getting enough blood, that would be a forwards effect. <coughs> Sorry. Orthopnea, so that's difficulty uh, breathing when lying down. So that's talking about something with the lungs, fluid in the lungs, that's a backwards effect, as is crackles, because that is due to fluid in the lungs. That is also a backwards effect. Okay, so that is left side heart failure. Let me have some water. Let's do right side heart failure. So now, same little diagram, but now we are putting the dam, we're putting the, the issue on the right side of the heart. So our backwards effects it are going to be due to where the blood came from, what is backwards one step. So it's going to be due to edema in the systemic circulation, so edema throughout the body. And our forward effects, once again, that's going to be due to decreased perfusion. So we're going to have decreased perfusion of the lungs for right side heart failure because the lungs are the forward step. Okay, let's get into some specifics. 
starting with <clears throat> backwards effects. So once again, blood is pooling up in the backward step, go back one step, blood is pooling up in the systemic circulation. So we're getting edema and swelling all over the place throughout the body. Um, so the veins are most susceptible to this because the veins don't have those strong muscles. Um, so they are just essentially more like flexible. And so they can really fill up with that fluid and you'll see the swelling more in veins. Um, so you will see some things uh, because of this sort of general systemic edema. Some of the types of specific signs you might see would be uh, an enlargement of the spleen or splenomegaly, an enlargement of the liver or hepatomegaly. So that just means literally they are just full of fluid and bigger than they should be. Um, fluid in the abdomen, so ascites, that is edema within the peritoneal cavity. Swollen feet and legs, so just sort of classically what you think of when you think of swelling. Um, and specifically that pitting edema, the one I showed you the picture of before, where if you press on someone's leg and it leaves a little divot, that is a classic symptom of right side heart failure. And then another classic symptom is jugular vein distension. So your jugular, jugular vein is the one or one of them in your neck. Um, and since it's right there on your neck, it's really obvious. You can see it really easily. Distension just means it's gotten bigger. So you can see in this patient um, that they have an enlarged jugular vein. So the way we say that is they have jugular vein distension or JVD, classic symptom of right side heart failure because that is edema in the periphery, edema in uh, the step before the right side of the heart. Okay, so that's backwards effects. Let's think about forwards effects. So what is forward from the heart, the lungs? The lungs are getting inadequately perfused. They're not getting enough blood. So what do the lungs do? They give oxygen to your blood. So if your lungs aren't doing their job enough, your blood is not gonna be well oxygenated. Um, so because of that decreased oxygenation, you're gonna see things like um, hypoxemia, which is decreased amount of oxygen in the blood. So decreased blood oxygen concentration, essentially. Um, and then cyanosis. So cyan means blue. So this would be like blue skin, blue lips, blue nails. Um, <laughs> once again, due to that, decreased uh, gas exchange in the lungs because you need to have blood flowing through the lungs in order for it to get oxygen in the lungs. Okay, so those were a couple examples of signs and symptoms of right heart failure. For each one of these, I want you to identify, is it a backwards effect or a forwards effect? Okay, so let's think about it. Jugular vein distension. That is an example of edema. Edema is always going to be a backwards effect. So this is backwards. Cyanosis, that is due to not enough oxygen. Um, so if the blood doesn't have enough oxygen in it, it's because the lungs aren't working well, so that's decreased perfusion. That is a forwards effect. Ascites, that is a type of edema, edema within the peritoneal cavity. Edema is always a backwards effect. So, back, so backwards, forwards, backwards. Okay, beautiful. So that was chapter. I know it was a lot. I will tell you that is the hardest chapter of this unit. But like I said, once again, you can really logic your way through those signs and symptoms with this diagram. This diagram, and then if I go back, that diagram and this, nope. There we go. Right here. This diagram and this piece of information. Forward effects, decreased perfusion. Backwards effects, edema. So if you've seen a sign and symptom, you're gonna ask yourself, okay, is this sign or symptom due to edema, due to more, too much fluid in whatever that region is? If it is, then it must be a backwards effect. Or is this sign or symptom due to whatever organ is being affected is essentially not working the way that it's supposed to? If it is, a, it's a forward effect. And then if you figure like, oh, okay, it's a backwards effect, the edema is in, you know, the periphery. We're talking about ascites. So it's too much fluid in the peritoneal space. And it's a backwards effect. That means that going backwards, the failure must be in the right side of the heart. I know. Just lots of practice. That's why I said draw this picture so you have one less thing to think about. Maybe even write on your scratch paper. Forward effect equals decreased perfusion. Backwards effect equals edema. That will help you 
logic your way through a lot of these signs and symptoms. It's going to be a way easier way of remembering everything than just like trying to cram it all into your brain. <clears throat> okay, we're doing great. So we're going to keep on going on. I believe in you. Uh, next chapter is chapter 16, which is ischemic heart disease and conduction disorders. So um, a little review from module one. I've already used this term multiple times uh, in this lecture, so hopefully you've already remembered. But what is ischemia? So ischemia is decreased blood flow. So essentially, like a blood clot. There's just blood not is not getting to where it needs to be. Okay. Um, that is in contrast to an infarction. Infarct or an infarction. Yeah, so an infarction, death. So necrotic death due to ischemia. So they are related, but ischemia causes infarction. So lack of blood flow, blood flow causes a specific type of necrotic death or it is just necrotic death, but like that specific situation we call infarction because it's such a classic pattern. Ischemia, less blood flow leads to necrosis. Instead of saying like ischemia induced necrosis, we just say infarction. So based on that, which one do you think is worse for your health, ischemia or infarction? So ischemia is just a blood clot, right? Maybe the blood clot goes away and then you're fine. Infarction is necrosis. Stuff has died. And necro necrotic cell death, remember, is the bad cell death. So it's like the cells are exploding. They're releasing toxins and stuff everywhere. It is very bad. So prolonged ischemia can cause infarction, which is why ischemia can be dangerous. But infarction itself is much worse. It's like the, the outcome that is dangerous. Okay. And then once again, infarction is a type of necrosis. Necrosis is the bad cell death, meaning it's cell death that's only due to injury. It's never due to like a healthy physiological process. Um, it can be due to other things besides hypoxia and just besides ischemia. So like trauma, toxins, things like that. But for this chapter, you just got to know ischemia. It's always bad. Necrosis is never healthy. Um, and remember we watched that video where we saw like the apoptotic cell and it kind of just like compressed itself into little packages and kindly recycled itself for other cells. Whereas the necrotic cell was there and then all of a sudden it just disappeared. It's because it, the cell like literally explodes. So when it explodes, it's releasing like toxins and inflammatory mediators and all these things that cause that further damage the tissue around it. So um, it's sort of a, you have like the center of the damage and then all around the periphery, there'll be additional damage. So it's really bad. And then these are just some examples. We talked in module one about um, like gangrene, frostbite, these are examples of necrosis. And then the one we are going to talk about for this unit is myocardial infarction or an infarction within the heart, a heart attack. Okay, so most of this chapter is spent on ischemic heart disease. So once again, ischemia, not enough blood getting to the heart. So deprivation of blood to the myocardium. Myo means muscle. So we're specifically talking about the heart muscle. There are other tissues within the heart but the muscle is most of it. So usually when we talk about the heart, we're talking about the muscle itself. Um, so there are, because of the decreased blood flow to the heart, to the coronary tissue that causes ischemia, if that ischemia keeps going, it is going to cause an infarction. So it's going to cause cell death. Okay. Um, there are essentially two different types of ischemic heart disease that we are going to learn about for this module. Um, but the, regardless of the type, the most common cause of uh, ischemic heart disease is coronary artery disease, or CAD, C-A-D for short. So this ties into what you learned in module two. This is atherosclerosis. So here we have um, this plaque, which is all full of you know, lipids and things like cholesterol, and it's building up on the walls of these arteries and narrowing the arteries. Um, so the coronary arteries are especially prone to atherosclerosis. Do you remember why? It's because they're so narrow. Exactly. So a little bit of buildup makes a big, a big effect. Um, in addition, uh, just because um, of where the heart is, it's moving around a lot, it's doing a lot. These uh, plaques are prone to rupture, meaning they're prone to falling off. And then they can travel to other places in the body and cause a like a blockage. And that's called an embolus. 
Um, so an embolus is just a piece of something that is broken off and traveled to someone else, somewhere else and, and blocked blood flow. Okay, so if you go back and look at this picture, um, there's essentially two ways to treat coronary artery disease when it's very severe. Uh, you can imagine, like, this is mostly fat. Fat is compressible, right? So we could just kind of, like, smoosh that stuff off to the side, and that would help. That would help open up the arteries. Um, so that helps us understand some of the interventions for um, coronary artery disease. The first being a coronary, or sorry, <laughs> I'll start over here. The first being a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, or in other words, you stick a little balloon uh, actually through the coronary arteries and then pump up the balloon and it just smooshes that plaque off to the side. So it helps clear, um, clear through. So that is a uh, PCTA for short. And then the other option would be a coronary artery bypass graft. So now this is like things have gotten really serious. And instead of trying to just uh, open this up, we're just going to bypass this problem. So we're going to put it a new blood vessel that just goes around this. And so even if this gets blocked, we're not too worried about it. Um, so usually the way this is done is grafts of healthy ves vessels are taken from somewhere else in the patient's own body as opposed from like opposed to donor tissue. It's just because you're not as likely to reject or have adverse side effects from your own tissue. Oftentimes these vessels come from um, the saphenous vein in the leg. So it often comes from a leg vessel just because it's uh, nice, easy to access and it's right there. So just be attached to the aorta and then down into the pulmonary, or sorry, into the coronary circulation to bypass that blockage. So those are the two interventions for coronary artery disease. That should say CAD. Okay. Um, so that takes us to this idea of acute coronary syndrome. So acute meaning sudden onset. Um, so this is an acute version of ischemic heart disease. So all of a sudden you have a, essentially a medical emergency, sudden onset chest pain. These are essentially the two diseases that you're learning about in this chapter. Um, the first is unstable angina. <clears throat> and the second is a myocardial infarction, which is what is usually people refer to when they talk about a heart attack. Um, when you read through your chapter, you will notice that the textbook talks about some different types of myocardial infarction, STEMI or NSTEMI. Um, so a STEMI type of myocardial infarction would be that uh, blood vessel, that coronary artery is completely blocked. It's been completely filled up with that plaque and so no blood is getting through. That's good, what is causing the ischemia and that's what's causing the infarct. Um, and NSTEMI is instead of a complete blockage is you're having some sort of mismatch between how much uh, oxygen the heart needs versus how much it's able to get. Usually there is still a component of coronary artery disease involved here because you have decreased blood flow to the heart, but maybe the heart is also having to pump really hard and work really hard, so it needs a lot of oxygen. And so it's blowing through its oxygen super fast and it's not able to get enough from the, from the blood. So it's going to become ischemic and then if that continues, uh, you will get um, infarction. So STEMI versus NSTEMI, the textbook goes into a lot of detail about how to like tell the difference between the two using different markers. That is beyond the scope of what you guys need to know for the midterm. The most important thing that you know is that there are two types of acute coronary syndrome and that that is unstable angina and myocardial infarction. Okay, so let's talk about angina. The, the full name is angina pectoris, which just means a uh, ch chest pain. So squeezing pain in the chest. Um, it is due to that ischemia, due to lack of blood flow to the heart. Specifically, this is temporary ischemia. Um, any ischemia is probably going to be painful. The heart's like, ah, help, I'm, I'm suffocating. I have no oxygen. And it's going to be painful. But it's temporary, meaning you're not going to have that infarction. You're just going to have just like little bouts of ischemia. Uh, so there's essentially two types of angina. Stable angina, that is someone who has sort of like bouts of chest pain, almost like attacks of chest pain. Um, and generally that can be treated with medication. So they have it kind of under control, although it's like not a great sign in general. It means that there's probably going to be 
um, additional interventions in the future, like maybe diet changes, lifestyle changes, um, or other things that we'll talk about more on the next slide. Um, the other type is unstable angina. So this is essentially the first time chest pain happens. This is a medical emergency because the first time chest pain happens, you don't know if it's a temporary ischemia. So you don't know if it's angina versus prolonged ischemia, which is going to cause an infarction. So a heart attack. Um, so someone can have unstable angina just once and it never turns into stable, but oftentimes unstable angina is a, a warning sign that you could eventually go on to <clears throat> have recurrent uh, chest pain. Um, usually unstable angina, that very first attack is due to a ruptured plaque. So a piece of the plaque is broken off. Um, okay, so treatments, nope, signs and symptoms and treatment. Uh, so chest pain, essentially all of the things you've seen in TV with people having like, ah, oh, it's a heart attack. The signs and symptoms are gonna be very similar. Chest pain that's disguised as, described as pressure, burning, heaviness. Um, there's a specific, uh, name for this called Levine sign. Uh, so people will take their fist and like put it over their heart, like in this picture here, this guy, Levine sign. Um, in women, oftentimes they repeat, report that the pain feels more like heartburn and less like that squeezing pressure because there are some sex differences between some of uh, these different coronary diseases. Um, things that are so, these first three, that's gonna be similar for angina and for myocardial infarction. This next two are specific to angina. So because angina is temporary, um, what will happen is pain will get worse with exercise, but it's gonna get better with rest. And that's because if you're resting and the heart doesn't need as much oxygen, then the amount of blood it's getting is gonna be sufficient and the pain will go away. Um, and then similarly, people who have angina, specifically stable angina, can treat it with medication, specifically a type of medication called nitroglycerin, um, which essentially is like a super fast vasodilator. So uh, you put it under your tongue, uh, medicines under the tongue get absorbed really, really quickly. And so it's like a super fast way to open up those coronary arteries and then increase blood flow to the heart, which reduces that pain. Um, and then finally, someone who has stable angina, so they keep having those repeated pain attacks. Um, that usually means that they are not getting enough blood to the heart, so you're probably having some pretty severe atherosclerosis. You don't want that to continue to a point where it completely occludes the coronary artery, right? Uh, so one of the possible treatments um, would be something like surgery, so that coronary artery bypass. So you could uh, take a vein from the leg and use it to bypass that blockage. Um, that would help treat that chest pain. Okay, so that's angina, which once again is due to what? Let's check for understanding. What causes the pain, the chest pain that is associated with angina? Yes, yeah, so it would be temporary ischemia. So it's not prolonged, it's not gonna cause any tissue death, but you're still having not enough oxygen getting to the heart, so that's gonna be pain. That is in contrast to a myocardial infarction. This is usually what we were talking about when someone says like they had a heart attack. Usually they are talking about a myocardial infarction. So infarction, once again, necrotic death of tissue due to ischemia, due to lack of blood flow because of that prolonged ischemia. Um, so this can be due because that coronary artery is completely blocked. It could also be due to a plaque broke off from somewhere else and then traveled to the coronary artery, which is very narrow. So a little plaque somewhere else that like wasn't a big deal over here travels into the coronary circulation, which is very narrow. Now it is a big deal. Um, and then it also, like I mentioned, can be due to if demand overwhelms supply. So if the heart is just working so hard that it's just chronically not able to get enough oxygen, even though the blood flow is kind of working okay. Um, so that can happen with things like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the heart is just enlarged and not working as well. That's usually secondary to something like hypertension. Okay, so how do you diagnose a myocardial infarction versus angina? Both are chest pain, right? So how do you know if they're having a heart attack, if they're having a myocardial infarction? Um, the biggest thing you're gonna use is if it's an infarction, part of the heart has died, right? Some of the, that tissue is dead. So you're gonna be able to see that. Um, you can see it in two ways. 
with cardiac markers. So these are proteins that are normally living inside, they exist inside of cardiac cells. If those cardiac cells have died by necrosis, remember in necrosis, the cells explode. So now those proteins that should only be inside of heart cells have exploded and they're all in the blood. So two of the markers that you look for for uh, myocardial damage would be troponin and CKMB. So these are two markers that you can just take a blood sample and check to see if those proteins are present. That tells you that that person has had a heart attack recently. Um, and then of course, the other <clears throat> classic diagnostic would be an electrocardiogram or an ECG. So this is essentially taking electrodes and putting them around the body and measuring the uh, like conductivity of the heart and if, it, if the conduction is moving properly. Um, if there is dead tissue within the heart, the conduction of electricity through the heart is not going to work normally because it'll get stopped at the dead, the dead tissue. Um, so uh, ECG is a better diagnostic tool, but it is time sensitive. So it can only be used within six hours of that myocardial infarction. That's important to keep in mind because sometimes the symptoms aren't like, oh my God, horrible chest pain. It could be like when we're talking about angina, like heartburn or something, something where you weren't really sure if it was a big problem until it persists. So that's why you want to remember both of those things. Um, and then just a reminder, um, ECGs, you need to know what it is. And you need to know that an ECG is important for diagnosing a myocardial infarction. You do not need to read for different ECGs. There's stuff with that in the chapter. You will learn all of that later in core. You don't need to do it. Okay, so signs and symptoms of myocardial infarction. Some of them are very simple, similar to angina. So that um, crushing, radiating chest pain, the chest pain can radiate. Uh, to the shoulder and jaw, and especially down the left arm, that like classic left arm pain. Um, specifically, the things that differentiate myocardial infarction from angina would be chest pain that lasts a long time, so longer than 20 minutes, and does not improve with rest. Um, Levine sign, once again, fist to chest, diaphoresis or sweating, that's due to just your autonomic nervous system gets all messed up because you're in so much pain and it's panic. Um, nausea, nausea and anxiety. Um, anxiety is going to be due to uh, if the heart is not pumping enough blood, then not enough blood is getting to the brain. So that's going to cause some cognitive effects, not to mention the just anxiety of the chest pain. <laughs> um, and then dyspnea, shortness of breath and fatigue. Once again, you're not getting adequate perfusion just throughout the entire body. Um, you can also have a feeling of fullness or indigestion, which is sort of a less well-known um, sign and symptom that is more specific to women. So this is really important to understand because something like this, like, oh, like when's the last time you felt nauseous? Like yesterday, right? <laughs> like, um, so these are things that are important to educate uh, patients about because the symptoms can be different and it is possible that someone could have a heart attack and never have like horrible chest pain. Um, so good to look out for some of those different signs and symptoms. In terms of the ones you absolutely should know, these two, pain that lasts longer than 20 minutes and does not improve with rest, those are very important signs um, because they are different than angina. Also, diaphoresis, that's another big one. So just a uh, sort of, sorry, that there's a timer going off. I'm just going to go turn off that timer. I'll be right back. Oh, just kidding. My husband's got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so to compare and contrast and just kind of summarize the difference between myocardial infarction versus angina. So both of them are types of acute coronary syndromes, meaning they're both due to something goes wrong with the coronary circulation, which leads to ischemia. Both of them are acute. So they are both types of sudden onset. Angina, once again, um, it is a temporary ischemia, so the cardiac muscle survives that ischemia. There's no cell death. It is still painful. Myocardial infarction, prolonged ischemia causes necrotic cell death. So that's going to be the exploding bad cell death of heart tissue. Key differences in understanding uh, sort of helping to differentiate between these two based on signs and symptoms. First off, myocardial infarction, cells are exploding right? Those cardiac cells are exploding. They are releasing cardiac proteins into the blood. 
So those markers like cardiac troponin are going to be elevated in myocardial infarction, but not with angina. Um, and then the second one is chest pain with myocardial infarction is not relieved with rest or nitroglycerin because uh, the issue is you have like complete occlusion or complete ischemia that has lasted so long that cells have died. Those cells aren't going to undie if you now all of a sudden take a nap or if you increase blood flow to the heart, that damage has already been done. So the, the two key differences, you absolutely need to know both of those for the midterm. Check for understanding. Uh, what is a similarity between myocardial infarction and angina? Ignore that. So there's many things you could write here. I have to fix it. We got it. There we go. Uh, there are many things that you could write here. Uh, you could say that they're both types of ischemia. They both cause chest pain. Uh, they are both due to coronary artery disease. Can I please move this? There we go. Um, and they both can be treated with that bypass surgery um, just to kind of get around the main problem and make sure blood is still getting to the heart tissue. Um, okay, so those are similarities. What are some differences between myocardial infarction and angina? The typo was there. So myocardial infarction, once again, tissue has died. So you're going to see markers of tissue death. So things like cardiac troponin, the pain is going to persist. Angina, temporary. Ischemia, so you're still going to have pain, but it's going to get better with rest. It's going to get better with nitroglycerin. So that's the difference between the two types of coronary artery syndrome. So the two different types of, um, sorry, <laughs> acute coronary syndrome. So difference between not enough oxygen getting to the heart, myocardial infarction, and angina. I want to take a minute to understand the difference between heart failure, what we started with, and myocardial infarction, because these are both heart things. Um, they can be related to one another, but they are different. So I want to make sure you guys understand this difference. So usually when someone says like someone had a heart attack, they mean they had a myocardial infarction. A heart attack's like, oh, my chest, you know, that is a sudden event, chest pain, myocardial infarction. So for me, that helps me understand or like remember that in my brain because I think, oh, if you see someone on TV, they're having a heart attack, it's a sudden thing. Um, so we have sudden onset, prolonged ischemia, the muscle is dying. Um, because some of that muscle has died, uh, the heart is going to be damaged. And because of that, the heart is not going to work as well as it needs to in the future. So damage from a myocardial infarction can lead to heart failure later. But heart failure is usually something that doesn't just come on suddenly. It usually has to develop over a period of time. Okay. Myocardial infarction, cells in the heart are dying due to lack of oxygen infarction. Heart failure, the heart is just not doing its job for whatever reason. Either it's weakened or it's just having to work too hard because there's other issues in the circulation. Um, so that's usually a chronic disease that takes a long time to develop. Uh, both of them, myocardial infarction and heart failure, can cause cardiac arrest, which is essentially when the heart stops beating completely. But they would be for different reasons. So in a myocardial infarction, the heart would stop beating completely because so much of the tissue has been damaged. And usually it would be tissue that is involved in conduction through the heart um, that the heart just physically cannot keep beating because so much of that tissue has died. In heart failure, it's usually because the heart has become so weak and so damaged that it essentially just like fails. It just, it's like, once again, to use the gym analogy, if you're lifting really heavy weights at the gym, you can do it for a while, but then at some point you're just trying, trying, trying it, ugh, you fail and you just can't lift it anymore. So that would be cardiac due to, cardiac arrest due to heart failure. The heart just gives out. So one is the heart is so damaged it stops beating. The other is the heart becomes so weakened and heart it stops beating. Um, and here's just a nice little diagram to help once again compare and contrast these two. Specifically, I want you to um, notice these signs and symptoms. So some super helpful signs and symptoms to differentiate these two for you. Crushing, radiating, sudden onset, chest pain, heart attack, myocardial infection, Levine sign, fist to chest, diaphoresis, sweating. 
those are also classic signs and symptoms of myocardial infarction. Heart failure, uh, PND, so that was uh, proximal nocturnal dyspnea, so trouble breathing at night. JVD, jugular vein distension, edema in the jugular vein. Uh, swelling, edema in general, um, and then cough, so edema in the lungs. So, and usually the disease are things like, oh, they've had a cough for a month, you know, not like a, the sudden onset cough is not usually, well, I guess that's like a cold. Anyway, that's not heart failure. <laughs> okay, check for understanding. For each of these, I want you to tell me, is this sign or symptom indicative of heart failure or myocardial infarction? Once again, you can pause. Okay, let's do it. So diaphoresis, that's sweating. Think, oh my gosh, sudden attack, you're you're freaking out, your chest hurts. Which one's that gonna be? Myocardial infarction. Uh, Levine sign, fist to chest, pain, myocardial infarction. Crackles in the lungs, fluid in the lungs, edema, heart failure. Orthopnea, once again, that's difficulty breathing while lying down, that's involving the lungs, it's involving edema in the lungs. That is a classic sign of heart failure. Whew. We're almost done <laughs> with this chapter. <laughs> Okay, uh, next one, or next concept to understand, and this feels so counterintuitive, um, but this is in part why even stable angina can lead to some heart issues over time, and that's something called ischemia reperfusion injury. So oxygen um, is a super reactive element. It's a super reactive atom. You might remember this a little bit from chemistry, but oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons. It really likes to bond with other things because of those electrons. Um, so because of that, oxygen can form something called reactive oxygen species, which is essentially oxygen with like an extra electron that just will bind to anything and just cause all sorts of damage and calamity throughout the cell. So usually your cells are constantly just like dealing with the reactive oxygen species that are created and it's like not a big deal. But if you have ischemia, so no oxygen at all, and then all of a sudden reperfusion, it's like, when there was no oxygen, the cell kind of like stopped worrying about reactive oxygen species because there was no oxygen. And then all of a sudden you have oxygen again. The cell's like, oh crap, and it can't deal with it. So now not only did you have the ischemia, but you have actually a buildup of reoxygen, reactive oxygen species due to that oxygen, which is crazy. Um, and that can cause further damage to the heart. So um, this is important to know because it might help explain to patients why they're like, oh, my if I have stable angina, it's just temporary, you know, it's fine. Um, I'm not worried about it. It is a, a, something to still be concerned about because for each ischemic event, there's reperfusion and that's going to just damage that heart muscle a little bit more. So it can eventually contribute to something like heart failure, which is not what you want. Okay. Um, so really quick, let's talk about some, essentially the last concept for this chapter, which is dysrhythmias. Uh, which is a abnormal heartbeat. Um, this can be a complication of a myocardial infarction. Um, you can also have dysrhythmias for other reasons, like some people are just born with them. Um, you can have them due to like drugs, things like that. But for the reason it's in this chapter is because it's often caused by a myocardial infarction. Um, so this is sort of one of the big risk factors for someone after they have a heart attack. So um, the heart, in addition to having tons of muscle in it, because it's, you know, pumping that blood out, also has a lot of conductive tissue, so like nerves, that are helping to spread, they're not nerves, but they're like nerves, um, that are helping to spread that electrical signal through the heart to help it beat. Uh, so if one of those conductive regions gets damaged, then that beating signal is not going to travel normally through the heart and you're going to have an abnormal heartbeat. Um, so there's essentially two types of dysrhythmias or two categories depending on what part of the heart is being affected. Uh, so if the atrium is being affected then you'll have like a abnormal heartbeat that is originating within the atrium. So that is called atrial fibrillation. Um, so the atrium is kind of like quivering uh, you're having blood pooling in the atrium. Because you have blood pooling here, there's an increased risk of um, clotting. And sorry, I should do the left atrium. Um, because you have an increased risk, uh, risk of blood clotting, then those if a blood clot forms in the left atrium, the atrium is pretty big, so it's usually not a big deal. 
the problem would be that blood clot can then get shot out of the heart. That then it becomes an embolus. Um, if it was formed in the left atrium, that embolus could go to the brain. If it was formed in the right atrium, that embolus can go into the lungs and then cause ischemia and infarction in those tissues. So atrial fibrillation, the atrium are not pumping effectively. Ventricular fibrillation, the ventricles aren't pumping effectively. Um, so this is usually very bad because the, the ventricles are doing the pumping to whatever is the forward tissue. So essentially, uh, if this is essentially the heart is not working. So this is an extreme medical emergency. Uh, this causes rapid unconsciousness because essentially the heart, even though it's still electrically active, it's essentially stopped pumping. Um, so this will cause rapid unconsciousness and death. Okay, so I have two lovely videos here to help you just visualize the difference between um, atrial fibrillation and ventricular fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, the top chambers. The atria don't pump, they just quiver. Here's what it looks like from the outside. The atria looks just like a bag of wriggling worms. They don't do a good job of pumping. Okay, so that was atrial fibrillation. Let's watch ventricular fibrillation now. In ventricular fibrillation, electrical impulses start firing from many different points in the lower chambers of the heart, very rapidly and in an irregular rhythm. This makes the heart quiver and unable to beat properly. Ventricular fibrillation is fatal without prompt treatment. Okay, so those are essentially the two types of dysrhythmias that you need to know, AFib and BFib, or atrial fibrillation, AFib for short, ventricular fibrillation, BFib for short. Okay, we got it. Okay, check for understanding. What is a dysrhythmia? So that would be an irregular heartbeat. Uh, so there's something going on with conduction of that electrical signal through the heart, usually caused by, for example, a myocardial infarction. Um, and then the last thing you need to know from this chapter is infective endocarditis. So uh, hopefully this kind of tells you what it is. Infective caused by an infection. Um, endo means inside, sort of. Um, card, heart. So it's an infection inside the heart. Itis, inflammation. So it's a heart infection. Not good. Um, usually this is specifically an infection of the cardiac endothelium. So that's what the endo actually stands for. is the endothelium, which is the lining that lines the internal like it's essentially lining the atria and lining the ventricles. Um, these infections most commonly impact heart valves. Um, and that's because the heart valves are like blood kind of tends to pool around them a little bit. So blood is moving through the heart. And so the pathogen that's causing that infective endocarditis can kind of like hang out near the heart valve a little bit more and, and, uh, and cause an infection there. Um, so the good news is pathogens don't usually get into your bloodstream, right? Your immune system is set up to really keep them out of your bloodstream because if they get in your bloodstream, they're going to go everywhere. Um, so infective endocarditis, really the only time you're at risk for it is if somehow a pathogen has been introduced into the bloodstream, usually in combination with some sort of like immune suppression. So for example, IV drug use is probably the most common risk factor um, because someone who is using, uh, like injecting themselves with street drugs may not be always using a clean needle and things like that. So that is just increasing the likelihood of introducing pathogens into the blood. Uh, dental and surgical procedures are also another example because those are sort of the most common surgeries that people get and usually get them not at like a surgical suite. So uh, there's just more risk. Also, your mouth is full of pathogens or full of bacteria. And so you just you're cutting into things. There's already bacteria in there. Um, and then the last are <clears throat> hospital acquired infections. So uh, pathogens, bacteria that are already in the hospital. Um, these are especially caused by uh, intravascular lines. So if you have uh, something gets into an IV, then obviously that's going to get into the bloodstream and could put someone at risk of infective endocarditis. <sighs> we did it. Chapter 16, chapter 17, done, done. Are there more chapters in this module? Yes, yes, there are. Those are by far the two biggest chapters in the pie chart 
of module three, those two chapters are like 80%. These other things are a, a smaller fraction. So if you need a break now, take a break, come back and learn the stuff later. I'm going to keep going. So chapter 19 is disorders of the venous system. Uh, so disorders essentially of the veins. Remember, we started at the beginning reviewing the difference between arteries and veins. Veins don't have that thick layer of smooth muscle. They do not pump. Um, veins, in order for them to work, you have to essentially use the skeletal muscles around them. So this is why if someone's um, like on a long flight, you're supposed to get up and move around because uh, it just helps get that blood flowing so it doesn't get cooling in the veins. Um, remember also that veins have valves. Veins have valves, right? That's what helps keep the blood flow going in a singular direction. Um, otherwise, you'd have blood flowing backwards and you just would have a lot of like whooshing and that's not great. So um, some diseases that are related to issues within the veins. So we would call these venous diseases, uh, venous insufficiency, deep vein thrombosis, and varicose veins or variscosities. So let's start by talking about venous insufficiency. insufficiency. Um, so this is usually due to some issue within the valves. Um, so if the valves aren't able to like open and close nicely and make sure that blood flow is unidirectional, then you're gonna get this crazy like circular blood flow. That's bad because think it's almost like you're shaking up the blood. That's gonna make it more likely to cause all sorts of issues. Um, so because you're gonna end up having pooling of the blood, you have an increase in hydrostatic pressure that can cause edema. It also increases the risk of blood clotting because you are shaking up the blood because it's all turbulent in there. Um, so some risk factors for venous insufficiency are anything where um, essentially like the veins are weakened. So that could be due to obesity or pregnancy, um, or if you just aren't moving around a lot, so long periods of inactivity like a hospitalization, um, just not getting the help of getting that venous return going. Uh, venous insufficiency on its own is not necessarily like if you have been on a 17 hour flight, you have been at risk for venous insufficiency and it was probably fine. But uh, the issue is that it can cause things like this like edema, it can cause deep vein thrombosis, and those are more similar or more severe problems. So let's talk about that deep vein thrombosis or a DVT for short. Uh, so a deep vein thrombosis, thrombosis is the clot, so thrombo is that prefix for platelet. So a deep vein thrombosis is the blood clot that forms in the deep veins, specifically the deep veins of the legs, because um, once again, just the blood in the legs is having to kind of fight against gravity the most, and so it is most prone to blood pooling. So it's most prone to this specific type of blood clot. Um, so there are essentially three risk factors or three categories of risk factors for deep vein thrombosis. And we can summarize this with this nice little uh, triangle, which is called Virchow's triangle, or sorry, triad. Uh, so those three components are stasis of blood flow. So the blood is just sitting there, pooling there. Um, as blood is pooling, it is just more likely to form clots. Platelets don't like to be right next to other platelets for too long. If they are, they're just going to start attacking each other. Um, so examples of things that cause stasis would be uh, being sedentary, so being on that flight, um, immobility, being hospitalized, or valve dysfunction. Once again, if there's some issue with the valves and your leg veins themselves. Uh, next part of the triad is endothelial injury. So um, some of the things that, or one of the things that causes blood clots is injury, right? That's the whole reason your blood clots is to, in response to an injury. So if you have endothelial injury, meaning an injury to blood vessels, that's going to activate the coagulation cascade, and then that obviously can cause a blood clot. Um, so this would be due to something like surgery um, or trauma. So if you have ever gotten a orthopedic surgery um, or like a maybe a surgery on your leg or like a more severe surgery, like a knee, something like that, um, that is two parts of the triad, surgery and immobility. Um, so that is why, for example, I ruptured my Achilles tendon a few years ago and had to get Achilles tendon repair surgery. You have to be non-weight bearing for um, essentially like a month. You can be up and moving around, but you're like in the bed a lot of the time. That's two of the big risk factors. So because of that, they make you wear compression stocks. 
that just helps squeeze the blood out. Um, and then they have you take aspirin. That is a platelet blocker. So those two things are trying to prevent deep vein thrombosis. So those are two pieces of the triad. And then the last piece is hypercoagulability. Hyper means more or like too much. And then coagulability, too much blood clotting. So this can be due to all sorts of things. Um, cancers, uh, if you have a cancer that's increasing platelet production, then that obviously would lead to hypercoagulability. Um, hormonal contraceptives, like birth control pills, increase uh, coagulability. Uh, and then there's some specific different diseases and disorders that also contribute to hypercoagulability. Um, one of the most common ones is called antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, this is an autoimmune disorder that essentially activates your coagulation system. So those are the three uh, parts of Virchow's triad. Um, some of some like other lifestyle risk factors also play into this triad. So for example, obesity can lead to stasis of blood flow. Smoking can lead to endothelial injury. So um, these are things that put someone at risk for a DVT, but it ties into this triad. Um, so a blood clot in the leg, that sounds bad. It sounds painful and it is bad and it is painful. But what's especially scary about DVTs is the risk of embolus. So a break off of that clot. Um, so the thrombus, meaning the blood clot, if it breaks off from the leg, it's going to travel up the veins to the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart is going to then pump that embolus into the lungs where it's going to get stuck. Because essentially now this is where the, the most narrow vessels have been. Because this is a, a thick vein, thick vein. The heart is is got a lot of room. So the clot's not going to get stuck there. But once that clot goes into the pulmonary circulation, now those arteries are going to narrow down and the clot is going to get stuck there. That is called a pulmonary embolism. Um, so that can be like threatening because you are having a decreased blood flow to the lungs. So you are going to have some ischemia in the lungs, it's gonna cause um, respiratory dysfunction. So that um, can be caused like shortness of breath. Um, it can be, like I said, life threatening. Uh, some signs and symptoms of DVT. Um, DVT itself, not the pulmonary embolism, but just the DVT can be asymptomatic. So you might not know it's happening, which is why they're so scary. Um, but some of the things you could see would be due to essentially blood getting stuck behind the embolism. So that dam, blood is getting stuck behind the dam. Uh, so you could have some swelling, uh, pain, warmth, redness. That's all due to blood getting stuck down there. Um, you might also have some distension in some of these veins because once again, you're essentially having edema within these veins that are behind. So maybe like the blood clot would be up here. Here's where those swollen veins would be. Um, and then of course, if that DVT breaks off and becomes an embolus and travels to the lungs and becomes a pulmonary embolism. Um, so sudden dyspnea, sudden ability or trouble breathing. Um, and you can also have chest pain because it's painful to have a clot in your lungs and it's also gonna be hard on your heart. Okay. And then the last thing for this chapter are varicose veins or variscosities. Um, so these are essentially kind of this picture just these sort of distended, dilated, superficial veins. Um, usually this is due to valves that have weakened. So you kind of have like this turbulent circulating blood getting stuck there and just kind of causing like a little too much blood in that area, which uh, is making the vessels a little bit bigger. So you can just see them. Um, varicose veins are usually caused by anything that's going to increase blood pooling, so increase the pressure within the um, venous system. So that'd be like blood pooling due to sitting for a long time or standing for a long time without walking around, uh, pregnancy, um, and obesity, because that just puts more strain on the lower half of the body. Um, the risk of varicose veins increases with age. I feel like that makes sense as you get older, the elasticity of all of your vessels decreases. So if they're less elastic, you're more likely to have some valve dysfunction. Um, and they're also more common in women. Okay. See, that chapter was short. We're flying now. We're almost done. Chapter 20. 
respiratory infection and inflammation. So we started with the heart, heart thing. We did a little sidetrack to veins, which makes sense though. It's like still a circulatory system. And now we're doing a little bigger sidetrack to lungs, but the heart of the lung, they work together. So it's not that big of a sidetrack. Uh, before we start, some specific vocab terms you need to memorize when we are talking about lung pathology. Uh, the first is auscultation. So this is listening with a stethoscope. Um, so in this chapter, we're talking about specifically listening to lung sounds. Uh, dipsnea, shortness of breath. We've already been using that one. Orthopnea, dipsnea, meaning shortness of breath when laying down. Expectoration, coughing up sputum. I cannot think of or read that word without thinking of this line from Beauty and the Beast. Gaston is singing his little song. He goes, I'm especially good at expectorating. So he spits. He's good at spitting. Um, hemoptysis, which is uh, coughing up blood. Um, and then atelectasis, uh, which is a complete or partial collapse of a lung or a section of the lung. So these are all vocabulary terms that you need to put into your brain for this term. Like I said, you can use some of those prefixes we've learned about before. So like dis means difficulty, um, hemo means blood, that might help. Just remember some of these things. Expectoration, think of feeding the beast. <clears throat> okay, just a little tiny smidgen of anatomy review before we venture into the respiratory system. Um, the first is just remembering the existence of the pleural cavity. Uh, so the pleural cavity, all throughout your body, you have spaces, right? Your organs are all just smooshed up against each other. A lot of times there's a little space in between them. That's normal. Um, and often that space is normally filled with some kind of fluid, maybe like lip. Uh, so the pleural cavity is the space between your lungs and essentially your chest wall. It is normally there. Makes a lot of sense it needs to be there because your lungs need to expand into something, right? They don't want to hit your chest wall. Uh, so there's some space there. You want to keep your lungs like lubed up with fluid so that they have, they can move. Um, so where does this fluid that is in the pleural cavity, which is called plur pleural fluid, that is a normal thing. It is there to lube up the lungs. That sounds gross. Um, where does it come from? So that pleural fluid is an exudate, meaning it is essentially you have your blood and then due to hydrostatic pressure, fluid is leaving the blood. So not cells, just fluid. So um, if we think back to module one and just some different terms when you we were talking about like wounds and infections. Um, exudate would be like a blister that's just full of like that clear liquid. Um, that's an example of exudate. So there's not usually cells in this liquid or not blood cells, I should say. Um, and then where does that fluid go? So it's coming out from the blood and then it leaves through the lymphatic system. So blood is or fluid leaves the blood and then goes into the pleural space to become pleural fluid and then it flows out into the lymphatic that's important to keep in mind because if there's something wrong in the lymphatic system, you may have a buildup of fluid in the pleural cavity. Okay, um, so when we're thinking about respiratory issues, obviously we're going to think about how the lungs are working. Um, and you can learn a lot about how the lungs are working just by listening to them. Um, so these are some different types of abnormal lung sounds. Uh, crackles, which we've already heard. Um, is essentially due to fluid in the lungs. Um, crackles is usually related to heart failure or pneumonia. Um, wheezes, that's like a high-pitched whistling sound. That's usually due to the diameter of the airway has been narrowed. So that would be due to like in inhaling something, because like something stuck in there. Um, raunchy, low-pitched low snore-like, that's often due to inflammation and then friction, rub, grating, scratchy sounds, inflammation of the pleural surfaces. I'm going to play this video so that you can hear these different lung sounds. You don't need to like identify any of these on the midterm or anything. So if you want to skip it, you can. Um, but I still think it's interesting and you'll enjoy. <laughs>
I really hope you're watching this with captions on because watching the auto translate try to translate those lung sounds is funny and one of them the translation was oh no which feels fair so once again you don't need to identify the sounds themselves um but you should know uh, essentially what some of these different sounds are associated with so especially the crackles are associated with heart failure or with pneumonia Okay, so let's get into some specific diseases and disorders. Uh, so the uh, first is acute rhinitis, acute meaning sudden onset, itis meaning uh, inflammation, and then rhino, to me it sounds like rhino, rhino horn. So this is like your nose. Uh, so this is inflammation and irritation of mucous membranes in the nose. So most classically caused by allergies, um, but also can be caused by like viruses, like the common cold. Um, bronchitis, acute bronchitis, so once again, sudden onset, itis, inflammation, so this is inflammation of the bronchi and bronchioles, so inflammation essentially of uh, the lungs. Um, if that tissue in the lungs, if the bronchial tissue becomes really swollen, then you can actually have obstruction of the air passages, which is obviously going to make breathing difficult. Uh, bronchitis, I feel like I'm telling you things that you already know, who hasn't had bronchitis, right? So. It's usually caused by infection, so usually a viral or a bacterial infection, um, but it can also be caused by inhaling toxins um, that just cause inflammation of the bronchi. Um, usually bronchitis starts with something like the common cold or the flu, which then uh, essentially like moves down into the lungs. So signs and symptoms of bronchitis, persistent cough that has lasted for uh, more than 10 days, uh, chest pain, and then bronchi and wheezing. Um, and then pneumonia. So pneumonia is inflammation of the lung tissue. Um, it can be caused by, or sorry, pneumonia, what happens when you have that inflammation of the lung tissue is the alveoli, which are normally like at the very bottom of the, the like the bronchi, the bronchi branch into bronchioles, which then further branch into alveoli. So there's a little tiny, tiny um, sacs in the lungs. That's where the fluid exchange is actually happening, or sorry, that's where the gas exchange is actually happening. The alveoli are usually air-filled because gas, air, is moving through them. If the alveoli fill with fluid, that's pneumonia. So pneumonia can be caused by infections, bacterial or viral, um, but it can also be caused by inhaling something. So if someone's like drowning, um, and they inhaled a lot of water, that water can travel into their lungs and cause an inhalation pneumonia. Also, children are more prone to inhalation pneumonia just because they, um, you know, are eating stuff all the time. Um, or also, once again, inhaling chemicals that can cause inflammation within the airways. Um, more deaths in the United States are caused by pneumonia than any other infection, which is scary. So we are going to mostly primarily focus on infective pneumonia, specifically community acquired pneumonia or CAP, CAP. Uh, so community acquired, meaning not hospital acquired, they got that pathogen, they got that sickness outside of the hospital. Obviously someone who was in the hospital for a long, for a long period of time is at risk for getting those hospital acquired infections and pneumonia unfortunately can often be one of those. This is different. This is someone who gets pneumonia just out walking around. Sometimes we call it walking pneumonia. Um, so some risk factors for uh, community-acquired pneumonia. Generally, this is someone who has some sort of amino 
suppression. That could be due to uh, just advanced age, your immune system stops working as well as you get older, uh, underlying disease or disorder such as AIDS or taking an immunosuppressant such as a steroid, uh, smoking because you're just messing your lungs up and making them, you're damaging them and making them more prone to infection, um, and then other chronic lung diseases like um, COPD, which we'll talk about in just a second. There's a pathogen here that you need to know. Maybe you remember this guy from module one, Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, which is also called pneumoniococcus for short. Um, tells you right in the name what it causes. It causes pneumonia. This is the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia. You need to know that for the midterm. Um, there's a vaccine available against this specific um, pathogen. So it makes sense. It's the most common form of community acquired pneumonia. And pneumonia is the most common cause of death from infections. So we have a vaccine against it. Um, it is usually recommended for young children who maybe don't have a full robust immune system yet, um, or for older adults, or for someone who might be in one of these high risk groups. So some signs and symptoms of pneumonia. So essentially you have, um, if we go back and look at this picture, those alveoli, which are those sacs that are normally filled with air, now they're filled with fluid instead. So you're gonna have obviously difficulty breathing. Um, because this often is due to an infection, you're gonna have some infective symptoms like fever, uh, pleuritic chest pain. So that's like chest pain around the pleural cavity. So as opposed to like radi like center chest pain, you'll have like more diffuse chest pain. Uh, tachycardias, oh sorry, crackles. I put it in bullet because you need to know that one. Um, once again, you have that fluid in the lungs, so it's going to sound crackly. Uh, tachycardia, tachy means fast, so this is increased heart rate. Um, that is usually due to the lungs are not working properly because they're all filled with fluid, so the blood is not getting properly oxygenated. Uh, the heart is going to respond to that by increasing perfusion, by increasing the heart rate to see if it can like compensate for that lack of oxygen. Uh, pneumonia is diagnosed by a chest X-ray, where you can actually see um the the fluid you can see opaque things uh normally the lungs are filled with air it's empty space empty space doesn't show up on an x-ray uh but you'll be able to see that um fluid within the chest guys this is the last chapter we're almost done so chapter 21 which is restrictive and obstructive pulmonary diseases okay a little anatomy review like I said before, bronchi are the major passages. So that's like essentially you have uh, the trachea. So um, you swallow and food can either go into, or stuff can go into the esophagus, into the stomach, or it can go the other way that branches and that would be into uh, the trachea. So this goes into the lungs. That's why like sometimes, you know, if it goes down the wrong tube, some stuff has gotten into the trachea a little bit and you cough it up. Um, the trachea branches into the bronchi, which are like the big branches, and then the bronchi further branch into the bronchioles, which then at the very end of the bronchioles, you have those alveoli, which are the air-filled sacs at the tips of this whole system. They look kind of like grapes to me, except they're filled with air. Um, so the alveoli, once again, is where the gas exchange actually occurs. So they are the functional unit of the lung. Um, so as we just learned, if they become filled with fluid, they're not going to work as well. Um, also, if they become damaged or like compressed, then the, you're gonna have respiratory dysfunction. Um, and then finally, the pleural membrane, that's uh, the membrane that is lining, uh, essentially the pleural space. So the pleural cavity, once again, is that space between the lungs and the, the chest wall. Okay, um, so for, this last chapter, we have to remember this one last concept from a &P, which is bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. Um, so dilation, meaning getting bigger, and bronco, the bronchioli. So airways are getting bigger. Bronchoconstriction, airways are getting smaller. Um, your body does this naturally because uh, the bronchioles are lined with uh, smooth muscles so they can expand and contract. Um, but also this can be caused, you can have, constriction due to inflammation as well. Um, so there's a class of medications that helps stimulate bronchodilation. So that would be bronchodilators. So if you, for example, have asthma and you have an inhaler, 
that inhaler is a bronchodilator dilator most likely something like albuterol and you just breathe it directly into your airways and it acts on those smooth muscles to tell them to relax and widen the airways which is going to improve your breathing okay so a little review now let's get into our last round of diseases and disorders uh, the first one is a pleural effusion um, so pleural meaning the pleural space um, and effusion, we have extra fluid building up in the pleural space. So sometimes we call this uh, like water on the lungs, you have fluid stuck in the lungs. Um, because you have fluid here in the pleural space, the lungs aren't really meant to expand into this amount of fluid. So they're not going to be able to expand effectively. So that's going to cause difficulty breathing. There are lots of causes of pleural effusion. We already learned about one of them tonight. Um, regardless of the disease or the disorder that's underlying the pleural effusion, they're all caused by essentially one of two issues. Remember I said before, the pleural fluid, which is an exudate, so it's the liquid from the blood, it can come from two places or it comes from, it gets there in two ways, I should say. The fluid comes from the blood, um, so that's due to hydrostatic pressure and goes into that pleural space. And then that fluid leaves by going out of the lymphatic system. So if we have a buildup of fluid here, that can be due to too much fluids getting pushed into the pleural space. So that could be due to increased hydrostatic pressure, um, or it could be due to if there's like damage in the vasculature that's lining the pleural space, then those blood vessels can become leaky. And that can also increase the amount of fluid that's getting put into the pleural or the amount of pleural fluid. Um, and then you can also decrease lymphatic drainage, maybe caused by like a um, lymphoma or a tumor or something like that that is decreasing just the lymphatic circulation. Okay, so different causes of um, pleural effusions. Some examples of diseases or disorders that can cause pleural effusions: heart failure. We already talked about this one, right? So um, if the heart is not working well and you have a buildup of blood in the lungs, that is going to increase hydrostatic pressure in the lungs. That's going to increase fluid. Here's a question for you. That's the backwards effect, right? We're talking about fluid. What type of heart failure would that be, right or left side? That's right. It would be left side heart failure, right? Because what's backwards from left? It's the, the lung. Um, cancer can also cause pleural effusion. Um, like I said, it could be due to like a swollen lymph node or a tumor in lymph nodes that's impacting lymphatic drainage. Um, cancer can also increase capillary permeability, um, so it can cause damage to those blood vessels. Usually if you have increased capillary permeability due to damage, you're going to see additional cell types in that fluid and not just fluid. So you might see like some additional like some red blood cells so the fluid might be red it might look bloody um or you could even see some cancer cells so those both be indicative of cancer um infection also because infection is going to increase uh capillary permeability because infection can cause inflammation inflammation causes increased permeability because it's trying to get the blood cells to wherever that problem is um and then a pulmonary embolism as well because it is essentially increasing the pressure in the lungs and also causing damage. So it's a one-two punch for this first one. Okay, so some signs and symptoms of pleural effusion are all due to this problem right here. If you have too much fluid in the lungs, the lungs cannot expand correctly, so you're going to have difficulty breathing, dyspnea. Uh, tachnea, or sorry, <laughs> tachnea, that's a hard one. Tachy means fast, so this is going to be um, rapid breathing, which kind of makes sense if you think about it, right? Your lungs aren't working as effectively as they should. So your body's going to compensate by just, well, just breathe faster. That'll help us get more oxygen. Um, chest pain, uh, this can feel very uncomfortable and cause some fullness. Um, dullness to percussion, meaning if you tap on their chest, the sound is going to be less hollow. it will be more dull because it's full of fluid instead of filled with air. And then uh, decreased breath sounds, because once again, this lung that has the pleural effusion, it's not, um, inflating properly. Okay, so this is kind of similar in concept to the next one, which is a, a pneumothorax. So this is essentially a collapsed lung. Uh, but a collapsed lung is 
not due to fluid in the pleural space. It is due to too much air in the pleural space, but it's going to cause a similar thing, which essentially the lung has smooshed up on itself and it's not able to expand. Um, a pneumothorax can be caused by uh, disease, injury, um, or it can just like spontaneously happen for no known reason. In that case, usually you'd have like kind of sudden onset um, difficulty breathing. Uh, risk factor smoking, just smoking messes up your, your respiratory system. Don't do it. COPD, asthma, that's just chronic inflammation within your respiratory system is also just going to dysregulate everything in there. Signs and symptoms, one-sided chest pain. So you're having pain on the affected lung. Um, no breath sounds at all on the affected side. Um, difficulty breathing, of course. And then cyanosis. So if your lungs aren't working effectively and your blood isn't getting oxygenated enough, then that is going to cause cyanosis because the blood essentially is going to not get oxygen, which makes the blood more red. So it's going to appear blue. Um, because a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung is caused by this increased air, this is also why one of the treatments can be like essentially poking a hole to release that extra air. And then essentially a lot of times the lung will just pop back out. Um, for something like a pulmonary, or sorry, for something like a pleural effusion, you can't just poke a hole. You're going to have to go in and actually drain that fluid. So it's a little more complicated to treat. Okay, that brings us to our last disease for the module. Woo um, and that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Um, COPD, third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, so essentially, this is your alveoli just kind of stop working normally. Um, and because of that, you have progressive and um, chronic long-term respiratory dysfunction. Uh, there are two types of COPD that can be caused by uh, essentially like two main underlying diseases. There is emphysema uh, dependent COPD, which uh, essentially you have like too much air in the alveoli, so they lose elasticity. So it's kind of like they're overinflated all the time. Because of that, they're not working normally. They're kind of like tough. Oh, sorry. Um, and then the other type is due to chronic bronchitis. So chronic inflammation and just swelling here is going to also cause issues. So, uh, the major risk factor for COPD is smoking. Um, as far as I know, I don't know what the the data is for like vaping and COPD, my guess is probably not great. Um, the uh, like vapor in a vape has at first glance fewer chemicals than cigarette smoke. So that seems positive, but it certainly still has a lot of chemicals in it. Also, because you can like vape inside and in the car so easily, I think people tend to vape a lot more than they think they are. Um, so that can definitely cause a problem if you're like constantly exposing yourself to that vapor as opposed to maybe you had like two cigarettes while you were out at night. Um, so something to keep your eye on because vaping is still like relatively new in medical terms. Um, something that I definitely would not recommend patients do. So it's probably still going to put you at increased risk of COPD would be my guess. Okay. Um, so some signs and symptoms of COPD, uh, you're going to have difficulty breathing, um, regardless of the type of COPD. You're also going to have um, chronic cough, uh, wheezing, cyanosis, um, different signs and symptoms for the different types of COPD. So uh, you have like blue bloaters and pink puffers. Blue bloaters are associated with um, emphysema. They're called uh, blue bloaters because they have cyanosis, so they tend to be blue. Um, and essentially because their alveoli are just like super stuck in this distended position, they're having to breathe really hard to get air to move through those. So they're constantly like putting tons of effort into that breathing, which is going to cause something called a barrel shaped chest. So essentially it's just uh, over time, a change in the physiology or the anatomy. So that is a classic symptom of emphysema-associated COPD. 
Um, whereas someone who has a chronic bronchitis as their underlying cause of COPD, we call those pink puffers. So they are going to have more shortness of breath, um, have um, usually some other, sorry, they're going to have shortness of breath, um, but they won't usually have like the barrel chest and the sinus. Um, for what you guys need to know, definitely should know that Trouble breathing is and cough are definitely signs and symptoms of COPD. And then also good to know that specifically that barrel shaped chest is a sign of emphysema associated COPD. We got to the end. Yay! Uh, so some resources to help you study for module three, the learning guide. Always so helpful. Um, Quizlet sets, those are all in that, um, are all these helpful links are in that website, right? That is posted on Canvas. So Quizlet sets to help you study vocab, quizzes to help you practice signs and symptoms. Oh my gosh, it is so important for this module because understanding like left-sided versus heart, right-sided heart failure versus myocardial infarction. Um, understanding all of those things is gonna take some practice um, for that signs and symptoms. I recommend you draw out that flow of blood through the circulation and then write down to remind yourself backwards effect equals edema forward effect equals decreased perfusion and see if that helps you logic your way through those because you're going to have scratch paper on the midterm. So you'll be able to memorize that and then write it down to help you uh, on the midterm. Also within Dam Davis Advantage, your textbook, there's the personalized learning plan, which you guys work through a lot of these as assignments, but they're also um, helpful study, study tools. Okay. And that's it. That's module three. We did it. Great work.